It's a great uh, privilege and honor to be here. Thank you very much for the organizers and the sponsors for the invitation. It's my first time in Lithuania, uh, so I understood absolutely nothing from this morning. Uh, but it looked very interesting. It almost looked like a report card, so I don't know how you guys did. Did you pass or the report card that was being presented to you as small to medium-sized businesses? Are you passing or failing? I, I couldn't quite figure out from the statistics. What I'd like to share with you this morning is some of the latest research we've been doing. As Larry has mentioned, uh, I have the opportunity and a, an amazing privilege to work with some of the largest organizations in the world, some of the smallest organizations, both in the private and in the public sector. And although there are many differences, there's one simple thing that they all have in common. That managers are under enormous pressure to do more with less in less time. Do you agree with that, by the way? Of course. So there's this focus on doing things better, faster, cheaper. And what I'd like to share with you today is some of our insights that we've had of what is really blocking us from achieving this ambitious target, especially considering how much the businesses have already improved. So I'll start off with a very simple, two simple challenges that we see that are shared in all organizations. As you look at the performance of the organization, they've improved sometimes quite rapidly. I'm involved with many startups, and that's frequently what you see as a very rapid takeoff once customers figure out that your product or service is valuable to them. And then it sort of plateaus down, and it means that you've hit some kind of constraining factor. And the question is, what next? So, of course, there's only three outcomes. You could decay if you do nothing. Uh, you could try to improve a little bit. Uh, that's the green curve, kind of representing the stability part of our organization. So basic need for the organization is to remain stable. And then there's the red curve part, which is representing the growth. Dr. Henning Albright in his presentation has always asked, which is more realistic? Both the green and the red represents improvement, but which is most realistic? Considering how much you've improved already in your business, do you think that uh, the green curve is the most realistic if you have to set targets? Can I sh see a show of hands? Who thinks that the green curve is the most realistic way of setting targets for improvement? Very good. In many other places I speak, it's the opposite. So for the, who thinks it's the red curve? That's the most realistic. Yes. Okay, the rest are from the UN. You are sitting on the fence, no opinion, right? Waiting to see what happens. So, a very simple check to do to see which of these two theories are right, because they can't both be right, is to say which of those represents the increase in population on the planet. The green curve or the red curve? Of course the red, right? When I was born, 1969, the population was about 3.5 billion people. Only 43 years later, it's now 7 billion people. The doubling time is just over 40 years. This is exponential growth, right? So if your business is providing any product or service that is actually consumed by a human person, then you should be looking at the red curve. The companies that I work with that are listed on the stock exchange, their valuation depends that they grow at least as fast as the market is growing, which is the red curve. But if they want a special valuation, higher PE ratios, they say have to grow faster than what the market is growing. So even faster than the red curve. The problem is not which of these are most realistic. The problem is what it does to us inside of the organization. Because those that are pushing very much for the red curve say, guys, this is the time to make the change. We don't have any more time. We are losing out on the window of opportunity. Let's make the change now. The other sides are going, no, we can't. At least not any fundamental changes. We can make some small things, but not any fundamental changes. And immediately you face a conflict in organization. Some are pushing for the red, say pressure to change, in order to satisfy the opportunities for growth in the, in the demand. The other side are saying, let's not change now because we might cause problems. Let's rather focus on maintaining stability and harmony in the organization. And as long as you haven't resolved this conflict in, the, in your company, you get stuck there. Improvement becomes very difficult because there's a conflict between whether to change or not to change. 
The second thing that makes it difficult is that we all extrapolate from our past experience. So, when you look at a change that we make, and you consider how much effort and sometimes money goes into the change, of course we want to make sure that the change actually results in an improvement. For a for-profit company it means to make more money, now and in the future. If it's a hospital, to be able to process more patients through the hospital. If it's a quality laboratory, it's to get more quality samples processed through the laboratory. So the check is, we want to make a change, we want to make sure that it only, doesn't only improve one part of the organization, but it actually perf improves the performance of the whole part. And here's the challenge. We know that every improvement is the result of a change. But not every change results in an improvement. And the question is why? Why do so many of the changes we make in our organizations, and by the way, also in our life, don't result in improvement for the whole system? In fact, part of my PhD research was to see what's the percentage success rate. And it's terrible. About 20 to 40% of the changes we make, the average of about 30%, actually results in an improvement for the whole system. Which means the other side is about 70% of the changes we make actually don't make an improvement or sometimes causes the performance to go down. A good example from our personal life is who of you have recently gone on a diet? Anybody who have gone on a diet? Right, I see the men are being very honest. Good. Mary is especially. So uh, I don't want to use him as an example, but I have to say that the success rate for diets are even less than. 30%. Do you know what the highest success rate is of the most successful diet? 5%. 5% and success is simply measured by it's given you on average a 10% reduction in weight and you've been able to sustain that reduction over a period of 5 years. So when you look at an organization, we are continuously making changes. We are changing the sales incentive scheme. right? We are moving from centralization to decentralization. We're developing new products, we're changing our IT systems, we're going into new markets, we're appointing additional sales representatives. When you start looking at how many of those have actually benefited the organization, did the profitability go up measurably as a result of the change, you'll find that unfortunately the success rate is very poor. And the question is why is that? And our hypothesis is very simple. It's because we are confusing local improvement with system improvement. We think that the way to improve the system is to improve each of the parts. And it simply doesn't work that way. So, how can fear of constraints help to solve the problem? Because we have to, we have to acknowledge that we can't be always successful. But it would be nice if we could just switch the statistics, right? That sort of 50 to 70 percent of the changes we make actually result in improvement and the others don't much better than the current statistics. So, what I will cover to, to you today is, I assume that some of you might be new to theory of constraints, so I'll, I'll try to give you what's the essence of it. In fact, there's one word that summarizes theory of constraints. Um, we started off with trying to summarize it in uh, a book, and then in a few pages, and then one page, and then it became one paragraph, and then one sentence, and finally Eddie said, I've got it, it's one word. So I'll, I'll share with you what the summary is of theory of constraints. And I'll show you with you specifically two processes that I think are very applicable to, to apply immediately. The five focusing steps, how do you know where to focus? How do you know which changes are really important that can bring a lot of benefit? And which other changes? Not so much. And secondly, how can you quantify the impact of changes on the system as a whole? We call that footprint accounting. I'll then share with you the latest research about how do you apply this to you as a manager or as an owner of a business? What is really constraining your productivity? Because productivity is measured very simply in fear of constraints. Beautifully simple definition. It says productivity is output over input. So for business, what's the output? The output is the rate at which the business is making money through sales. So in fear of constraints,
which rate we call it throughput. So it's your total sales revenue minus total variable cost gives you your throughput. It's a rate at which that business is making money or generating money. Below the line is the input. And the input is essentially our operating expenses. The rate at which I'm spending money, my business is spending money to make the money. And when I compare this ratio, if it's larger than one, if my throughput is higher than operating expenses, I'm profitable. But I can only claim I'm becoming more productive when this ratio is increasing all the time. What we find is that companies, big and small, are increasing their sales, but at the same time they're increasing their costs at the same rate or even faster. So they're still profitable, but the profitability as a percentage to sales is going down. And in real terms, productivity is going down. So I'll share with you a little bit about what we found is the, the key thing for managers to improve their own productivity. Only to be measured then, will this help my business grow sales faster than what it's growing costs? And then secondly, how to apply it in operations. And operations could be manufacturing, it could be R&D, it could be a sales operation, it could be a finance operation. How do you apply these concepts to any system? I'll end up with two case studies. Uh, there are many case studies about theory of constraints in the public domain that you can look up. So I'll present two that's a little bit unusual. The one is from sales, applying this, these concepts to sales department, and the second one to an IT department. And then hopefully we'll have some time left for a few questions. So what is theory of constraints? Knowing what to change and what not. Dr. Eddie Goldberg, has written many books and each of these books added to the body of knowledge of theory of constraints starting with the goal of theory of constraints applied to manufacturing, critical chain to project management, necessary but not sufficient, to the idea of technology. Isn't it obvious in terms of distribution and retail and uh, the final book that Neria showed the choice which is really about the philosophy behind it. He said that theory of constraints can be summarized in one word, focus. But we needed to think carefully about what does focus mean? Because focus doesn't just mean knowing what to do or what to change. As importantly, and maybe even more importantly, it means knowing what not to change. And this is the key. If you get this wrong, you end up trying to improve everything. And this to me is the essence of what theory of constraints is. It's helping us solve a very simple problem. As business owners, as managers of certain departments, how do I differentiate between all the things that's under my responsibility that I can improve? And I'm sure you'll agree with me that you can improve everything every single aspect of the business. How do I differentiate between all the things I can improve from the few things I must improve to get more goal units? Whatever that goal unit is, whether to make more money, whether to change the world, like Steve Jobs says, to make a dent in the universe. The goal provides us with a very simple benchmark, a very simple measure to say, if you've made a change, how will this really help? Will it help me improve only a part of the system or will it actually help me move closer to my goal? So, the essence is, if you've tried to focus on everything, you're actually not focusing on anything at all. It's as if you were not focusing. And we'll do a small exercise later in the talk to show you what happens when we try to focus on more than one thing at a time. So what is the five focusing steps of theory of constraints? It's based on a very simple law that's been known for a long time and chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Which means, surprisingly or unsurprisingly, if I try to improve a system that could be viewed as a chain, what should be step one? Can anybody guess what should be step one? If it's true that the chain is only as strong as the weakest link, what should be step one? could find the weakest link, right? Very unsurprising. Very different to the traditional
traditional approach, which is look for all the gaps. So find some kind of way of benchmarking my part of the business against the best out there, kind of like the report cards that was shown this morning. And wherever there's gaps, close those gaps. That's the more traditional way. Do you agree? This traditional way is based on an assumption that's very seldom tested. The assumption is, if I close the gap between my performance and the benchmark, my goal units will go up. I'll actually make more money. Well, it's very simple to test it. To say, let's improve this and see, am I making more money? If I'm not making more money, what it's telling me is that that part of my business, that business process, even though it might be below the level of maturity that other people think is considered to be mature or best practice, for my business it's good enough. Does it make sense? How do I know it's good enough? Because by improving it, nothing happened to the improvement for the system. I'm not making more money, I'm not getting patient, more patients through the hospital. So actually it wasn't the level of good enough. That's how you identify things that you shouldn't change. And normally it's quite simple, but we get confused. We think that all gaps are important. We get the spider diagram that shows the gaps between our performance and everybody else, and we think by closing those gaps, we'll achieve the highest level of performance possible. It's simply not true. Thank goodness it's not true, because else we would never be able to focus. Right? We'll be chasing after every single opportunity. So, it's important to know what the goal is, because how else do I judge whether the change that I've made has actually resulted in improvement? If it's a for-profit company, very simple, am I making more money from this? If it's a for-profit company but it has a higher purpose, like make a dent in the universe, whatever that means, right? Uh, get patient people to, be, to live happier lives or be more healthy then you should check by making this change that does that improve. So once I understand the goal, I can then say, step one, what's the constraint? The system constraint or the weakest link? And the reason why we've added step zero is that without agreeing on what the goal is, we can't really agree on where the constraint is. If some people think that the goal is to satisfy customers, others say, no, that's not important. What's important is to satisfy employees. Others say, no, that's not important. What's important is to, to produce quality products or services. Of course, each of those people will then have a different idea of what's constraining me from getting more of that. Whereas if we agree very simply on what's the goal, then it becomes much easier to find where the real constraint is. People struggle, especially with service departments or we do a lot of work with government. They say, well, what's, I'm in government. What's my goal? And the simplest way of defining a goal is to simply meet the demand that's placed on my department. Effectively first, which means I'm meeting it with quality products or services, and then efficiently. So once I've got that goal clear, then it becomes simpler to identify the constraint. Step two says, now that I know the weakest link, now that I know where the scarce resource is, make sure I don't waste it. This is what step two means. Decide how to exploit and not waste this scarce resource. Step 3 is by far the most challenging. It says subordinate, and it's a very strong word, as strong as exploit. It says subordinate everything to the above decision. So whatever you've decided, what needs to be changed, or what conditions have to be in place, for me to better exploit the scarce resource and not waste it. Subordinate means go and change any policy, measurement or behavior in the business that's in conflict with that decision. And that stuff, that's where we hit those conflicts. Change, don't change. I'll share with you a few examples of what we mean by that. Step four says if you've subordinated and you've improved the level of performance and it's still not enough to get to the goal, only now go and elevate. Now go and get more of that scarce resource. So if the constraint was in the market, 
What does exploit mean? Exploit means understanding the potential that's in the market that I'm not exploiting. If my market share is 5%, what's the available opportunity for better exploitation? It's 95%. Does that make sense? Right. So why would I be thinking about going into new markets or developing new products? Those are all elevation strategies. Very risky, requires investment, requires time. When I'm sitting with such a small fraction of my current market share, why should I be paying attention to say, what will it take to get the other 95 to buy my products? Those are the conditions that I must satisfy to better exploit the scarce resource, which is the market. And then to think about what's blocking me inside my organization, any policy, measurement, or, or behavior that's in conflict with that decision, change only that. The rest leave the same. Elevate says, once you've done that and it's still not enough, now go and get more of that scarce resource. So if it's in the market, now think about going into maybe a neighboring country or adding additional products to it. But not before you fully exploit it. Because if you can't convince your customers in your local market with which you have a relationship already to buy more of your products or to pay more, what gives you the confidence that you can do that in another market with another product? That's what exploit before elevate means. And then step five, the original version said warning, if you've broken a constraint in the previous step, don't let inertia become a constraint. Don't just stagnate at a higher level of performance. Go back to step one. But here's the trick. Small kind of trick. Try never to get to step five. Why? Because whenever a constraint moves, I have to change the rules. And as soon as I change the rules, it introduces instability into the organization. It triggers these conflicts about change the rule, don't change the rule. So you might say, well, how do you do that? Think about McDonald's. Where do you think the constraint is for McDonald's? Any guesses? So what's the one thing that if they had more of it, it will always give more gold units, assuming that they want to make more money? Capital? Capital? capital or cash, right? But, you know, if you have a good business case, the market is very liquid, you'll always find cash. Could it be space? Putting more McDonald's down? You could argue that and say, well, maybe, you know, all the best spaces have been occupied, but again, if you're offering somebody a higher rental, it's a pretty good chance that they will agree to that, right? Could it be internal capacity? No, again, if you've got a good business case, there's no reason why you couldn't get more people. So what they've decided to do strategically is to say the constraint for McDonald's is the number of customers coming into McDonald's wanting to buy their products. So what does deciding how to exploit the constraint mean? It means that once they're in the shop, don't give them any excuse not to buy. Right? Why would you not buy when you're in a McDonald's? Apart from not liking anything on the menu. Right? Most people know exactly what they're going to get. That's in fact the attraction. It might not be the best, but we know exactly what we're going to get. Whether we buy it in Shanghai, or Rio de Janeiro, or Johannesburg, South Africa, or Vilnius. You go, you go there because you know what you're going to get. So, deciding how to exploit simply means Figuring out the things that will cause customers to leave, like long queues, will cause them to leave. Subordinate everything to that decision means change any rule that from time to time allows queues to build up. They have this policy, I don't know if you've heard about it, called the bus policy. What happens is when physically a bus of people stop outside, immediately they get off, there's a real chance that the queues will become so long that they start losing customers. So somebody shouts, bus, and everybody drops what they're doing, and they go and help. They man the counters, they man the grill, to try and get rid of that queue as quickly as they can. That's what some automate means. So in that scenario, what does elevate mean? Elevate doesn't mean 
let's go and get so many customers that now suddenly the bottleneck moves internally because that will be chaos. Now I have to change the rules and figure out how do I optimize the grow performance, right, so that that guy is never starved or blocked. They said, no. When we elevate capacity, we have to elevate the capacity equally everywhere so that the constraint never moves. And if the constraint always stays the number of customers want, wanting to buy my products, it means I can have a McDonald's way of running my business. And as long as the constraint doesn't move, that way of running the business can be the same for 100 years. So that's what step five is all about. It's not just a warning about don't stagnate at the higher level, but it also says if you, if you apply this strategically, don't think about identifying the bottleneck, decide where you want it to be. It becomes a control point for the whole business. It's how you will manage your business. So let's look at what it looks graphically. You've got some supply, you've got a process of converting the inputs into a product or service and then there's a demand. And in this case we might say it's this process, the one that can only do 10, to 10 per hour. So identifying the constraint means not just finding that it's this process, but seeing how much of its capacity are we losing. Maybe the system is only doing 5 and yet the bottleneck can do 10 per hour. Where am I losing that additional five? And that's what step two is about, is identifying the places where I'm losing capacity. Every time I do a setup or I'm doing planned or, or unplanned maintenance, I lose time. I lose time because of starvation or blockage, rework, overproduction is a massive one. For example, if this guy said, for me to be efficient, to save some setup, I need to produce in batches of 100. But the customers only want 20. Now what? This is a definition of overproduction, producing more than what the market really needs at the moment. So for this one guy to save maybe one hour of setup a week, what is he doing now? Is he causing everybody else to waste 80% of their capacity producing something that's not needed now? Does it make sense to everybody? This is why local optimization is so bad, because the intent is good. The intent is for me to be efficient. How do I do that? I say, I have a policy. You want to buy from me, you have to order 100. Why? Because making 20 is too inefficient. Well, for who is it too inefficient? Only for this resource. But for the rest, it's incredibly inefficient to make 100 when only 20 are needed. Because I have to pay for that materials, I have to pay cash that I need for something else to pay for the IT. And I'm wasting capacity and therefore time at every single process downstream. But that's never considered when we do this optimum calculation of how big the batches should be for this guy to look efficient. And this is what makes step two tricky, is to understand the difference between improving a part and improving the system by improving the bottleneck. Make sure that the bottleneck is never staffed, never waiting for stuff, never blocked because there's run out of space downstream or customers downstream. Make sure it's never overproducing. How does this apply? For example, I run a software company, one of the companies I run. If you take a software like SAP or you take software like Excel or PowerPoint, things that you might be more familiar with, what percentage of the functionality that software has do you think you actually use? 2%. It's interesting, when you speak directly to Microsoft and SAP, do you know the answer? About 20 to 30% is what the, the, the top super users are using. The rest about 5 to 10%. Now where do you think the bottleneck is for a software company? It's these top programmers that both have to fix the bugs with the current version and have to develop new functionality. Where do you think the biggest opportunity is where that resource is wasting capacity? It's in overproduction. For every hundred new functions that they produce, only the top guys will use about 20 of them. So the same explanation as I just gave in manufacturing, Everybody's paying the penalty for it because there's not a proper folder that says, is this really going to be used by 
by useless, how will they get value? Everybody's paying the, the cost for it. It's causing bottlenecks as it's moving through. It's almost like a snake swallowing a big back, a big buck. And that's why when we go into organization, they say we've got a moving bottleneck. Most cases, it's not because the product mix are changing, it's simply because they're producing in two big batches. The case study that I'll share with you is to think about how overproduction applies to sales and how you measure it. For example, if you're measured in how many sales opportunities I have in a pipeline, could there be some kind of temptation to put opportunities in there that you know has got a very small chance of action gap, but it makes you look good because you're meeting that local measurement. As I mentioned, step three is the toughest because it means breaking some kind of conflict between identifying what policy or measurement or behavior is causing one of these problems, one of the conditions that's wasting capacity on the bottleneck, and identifying what change I need to make, and then appreciating that there's also pressure not to make that change. There's a positive of making the change, there's a negative of making the change. But there's also a positive of not making the change, and a negative of not making the change. When we try to push changes, we tend to focus on the positive of the change, and the negative of not change. The people that are resisting the change are focusing on the positive of not changing, what they fear they have to give up or that they will lose when we make the change like introduce a new IT system and they, they, they fear the negative of making the change, the cost and the risks associated with it. So unless we, we can break these conflicts, we get stuck there. If we manage to break them, we come up with a new set of rules that says these are the rules that we need to better exploit the current constraint. And if we've done a good job, we'll make sure that we keep it in that place. Elevator Constraint says, as I'm removing these conditions, of course my performance, my level of exploitation will rise. I need some protective capacity, and I'll explain that in a moment with a simple simulation. So if I still want more, now it's the time to go and elevate, to go and get additional machines, go and get additional salespeople. But always exploit first before I elevate. And then, as I mentioned, the last step is be careful. You also sometimes have to break conflicts when you elevate. Maybe some of you have heard this policy of no new hires, right? So margins are under pressure. The CEO is looking at the margin and he says, guys, we can't hire any new people. And you go to him and you say, but my department is the bottleneck, right? I have too few salespeople. I simply not getting to all the customers. And if I could just get some additional salespeople, I know I will be able to sell more. And the CEO says, sorry, I have to be fair. I can't give your department more people and not everybody else. So unless I break those conflicts, again, I'll get stuck, just at a higher level. So that's what the theory of constraints five focusing steps is about. There's nothing complicated in applying it. Normally, Step one is quite simple. Look for where stuff is building up. So if you have a capacity constraint somewhere in your process, where will the build up of stuff be? It will be back orders, right? Customer orders will be waiting for them to be processed. So it's very simple that when you see a backlog of orders that you haven't yet processed and the lead times are getting longer, you know you have a capacity problem. The constraint is inside. Do the same here. Figure out where it is and how much capacity we lose because one of these reasons and identify the, the changes that have to be made to, to prevent those from being lost. If it's on the market side, and as I mentioned, where will the build up of stuff be? In this case, you'll be building up excess capacity, right? Because there's not enough orders. So if it's the market, what does this mean? This red portion is the market share you don't have. These are the conditions that if you could satisfy them, customers would be willing to pay more or buy more. Right? Being able to offer faster response time. Being able to offer lower prices from time to time. If the constraint is on the supply side, it means that there's some material or skill 
that is busy constraining your growth to a business. Do the same. Figure out how many of those resources or materials is out in the market. How much am I getting of it? Maybe I'm only getting 10% of the available tons that's out there. Figure out what I need to offer these suppliers to get them to sell more to me. And then the last thing where the constraint could be could be cash. I could run out of cash. So again the same thing. How much cash does the shareholders have? How much of that am I getting? What do I need to offer them to give me more of that cash? And if they're already maxed out, then jump immediately to elevate and see where else can I get cash. Right? So that's really how you apply the five focusing steps to any constraint in the business, whether it's in the market, whether it's in somewhere in operations, whether it's in supply side, or whether it's cash. Of course, if it's in the sales side, the first thing that you'll do is we say the number of salespeople is the constraint. Okay, how well are we utilizing their time? How much time are they spending in meetings? How much time are they spending filling in expense claims? Right? Those are all times that they could have utilized to sell more. So figure out what I need to change to reduce those things. So let me share with you just a quick example of why I claim this protective capacity part is so important. Goal rate for those of you that have read the goal, created a very simple game that's called the dice game. And essentially what it shows is you've got a little factory or a little business process and there's five steps in the process. Each of these steps, their output for the day is determined by the flow of the dice. So it could be somewhere between one unit per day or six units per day. So on average each of the steps can give you about three and a half units per day. So if you apply that to sales, it could be that the salesperson could make anything from one sales call a day to six sales calls a day, on average about three and a half. If it's in manufacturing, the first machine can produce somewhere between one and six per day, on average three and a half. It suffers from two phenomena. There's variation in each step, but there's also interdependency. For example, B, if it had the potential of doing six on a Monday, but A only produced one, how much can B do? One. Only one, right? And this is the problem. So what we do with this dice game is to say, if I gave you this factory, and I said to you, after 20 days of running this factory, how much output did you expect to get? Because I gave you machines, each with a capacity of three and a half units per day. How much would you expect after 20 days? And most people go, well, 20 times three and a half is 70. And then you allow them to play the game. And what they get is, to their shock and horror, they get only about 50% of that. They're getting 35. So somewhere in the process, we've lost half of our capacity. Why? First of all, if you look at this process, where's the bottleneck? Because you've got balanced capacities. So actually you don't have a bottleneck, you have interactive bottlenecks. It's the worst system to manage. You can't manage it, it's called chaos. It's a chaotic system. You, you simply cannot manage it. You simply don't, you can't predict, and this is what chaos theory is telling us, you can't predict accurately what will come out of this. It could be six or one. On average it will be about one and a half or 1.7. But you can't predict, you can't make any commitments to your customers if you're running a little process, whether it's a factory or sales process, that have balanced capacities. It's impossible to be reliable in your prediction. So you have two big problems. You're getting much less out than what you thought you should be. So you're overcommitting. And secondly, you can't be reliable. So when you look at the actual performance, what you see is this is the output performance. And the average is significantly below our expectations. So a few things to learn there. The output is always significantly less than the output of the bottleneck. So that we got 35, which is about 1.75, which is half of 3.5 if we had to pick a bottleneck. Secondly, balancing capacities creates a chaotic system. And lastly, we need a way of balancing the flow. And this is a 
concept that Gold had came up quite early on and it took, at least personally, me a long time to understand what is balancing the flow means. So let me share with you a very counterintuitive way of increasing the output of this. Because there could be many ways that the, the Six Sigma guys will tell you that you need to reduce the variation of the machines. And they'll be right, but reducing variation costs a lot of money normally and takes a lot of time. You could add buffers in between, right? Like cam packs. The guys, the lead guys will say, let's decouple these things by putting cam packs. But unless the cam packs are substantially big, it says what would happen if I create a bottleneck by slowing down one of the machines. Now think to yourself, if somebody gave you a factory that's already only producing 50% of what you expect, and I come up to you with a bright idea of slowing down one of the machines. What would you do to them? Let's see what's the, the outcome of it. Let's pick C, simply because it's kind of in the middle C constraint. Game makes a logical choice. Let's slow it down to be able to give only free on average, which practically means that person that's throwing the dice, if he was C, he can only throw between 1 and 5. So if he throws a 6, we'll ask him to throw again. And we'll see how much the system can do. What's my expectation now? So after 20 days, how much would I commit to be able to give from this factor? Immediately my expectation will change, right? 20 days times my free on average, the bottleneck can only do free, so I'll commit to 60. And then when I run it, I'm getting very close to 60 all the time. Why? Because what I've done is I've created protective capacity in front of it and behind it. So if you think about if they balanced, if all of them are the same, you can't actually build up inventory to prevent the bottleneck from not being starved. You can't clear away inventory behind it to prevent it from being blocked when there's been downtime downstream. But when you create a protective capacity by slowing it down, you're allowing these guys to build up buffer in front of C because they can run faster, they've got catch up, so if they go down, they not only have to keep on producing it free, but they have to rebuild the buffer so that free, the, the C guy is not stopped. And the same here, if there's down, down, downstream and suddenly this buffer becomes full because C keeps on producing, the DME needs this catch up capacity to clear the buffer very quickly, else C will be blocked. So it's a very counterintuitive solution. It does two things. It increases dramatically the throughput rate, and at the same time, it dramatically improves the reliability of the system that you can commit to outputs. There's still daily variation, but over a month period, it's actually becoming very reliable. You'll see that when you run it, you'll see that it's... So by slowing down the bottleneck, we create protective capacity in non-bottlenecks. If the starvation and blockage buffers work 100%, which means that they make sure that C is never starved or blocked, then the bottleneck capacity becomes the system capacity. So if the bottleneck on average for whatever reason ran at 2.8 per day, the system will run at 2.8 per day. If it ran at 3.5 per day, because we were lucky with the distributions, the system would have produced 3.5, on the condition that the buffers were 100%. And that's a quick trick of how you decide how big the buffer is. There's no magical formula to calculate precisely, but you could do it with trial and error. Maybe run it through a simulation game and see if I add additional buffer, does it increase the output, reduce the variation, or no. If not, then it's good enough. We created a little game. You can download it from the App Store. Um, what I'm intrigued in is to see what kids come up with. Because I played as a game, I tested it on my two boys, they're six and seven. And it's amazing how quickly they figure out how to win at the game. Because they're not stuck with trying to improve the efficiency of each of the resources. So if you're interested, it's, uh, it goes for charity if you download it from the app store and play. There's three levels. One, level one, you can't do anything. You're basically just running. There's no buffers. So you'll get to about the 35, but you have to predict how much you're going to get. And you'll get a bonus and that allows you to make some money. Level 2, you can modify the buffers. And level 3, you can actually modify the variations, but you have to pay for it. And 
have to see what's the maximum amount of money that you can get. So, the five focusing steps are giving us an indication what to change, and as importantly, or maybe even more importantly, what not to change. What's at the level of good enough? Yes, there might be a gap between my performance and some benchmark company out there, but it's at the level of good enough. How do I know it? Because by improving that part of the business, I'm not going to get more money. I'm not going to get more gold units. How can I quantify what the impact of such changes is? And this is where Fruper Accounting comes in. So say you have a business that is worth 10 million in sales and you're currently making 5% net profit. How can I predict, how can I quantify what the impact will be of changes that I'm making? And where do I find the biggest leverage opportunities? So a few simple tests. If I increase the average selling price of my product or service by just 1%, how much more money will the company make? Let me give you the common mistake that's made. People go, well, I'm only making 5% margin. So if I get another dollar because of an increase in price, only 5 cents of that will go to the bottom line. Right? It kind of makes sense to people at some level. The problem is it assumes that fixed costs are actually variable. So when you look at this simple format, you say, if I increase the average selling price here by 1%, 1% of 10 million is 100,000, right? Will my variable cost go up if I change my price? No, of course not. Will my operating expenses go up if I change my price? No. So the whole 100 million will drop to the bottom line. So I'll get from 500 to 600 million, or 500,000 to 600,000. That's a 20% increase in net profit for every 1% increase in selling price. Now, I'm not suggesting that you increase the selling price. What I'm suggesting is be very careful as a small and medium-sized business when you just give away discount. Very interesting distribution that we always look at is there's a list price for the product or service. What's the average price customers are paying? And what you'll find is it's nowhere close to the list price. It's very close to the maximum discount that the sales guys are authorized to give. And you can do a simple test. You phone your own company and you say, what's the price of this product? And they say, $100. And you say, what discount can you give me? And the salesperson immediately says 10%. Why 10%? Because he's authorized or she's authorized to give 10%. Not realizing that you have given away a huge amount of profit. I'm not saying that you should give a discount. I'm just saying understand the leverage there. And maybe offer 1 or 2% first. And so, say, you know, we normally don't give discount, but let me check with my boss. I know you're a very special customer. Come back and say, for you, only for today, 2%. Right? Do whatever you have to. The, the women are a little bit better than men, they know how to manipulate, so you'll be better to figure it out. But the idea is, is to understand where leverage is, right? Leverage is in price, first of all. So a company that's thinking about laying off people, what does it tell me? It means that they've given up. They've given up hope that they could sell more, get to higher prices. They're now focusing on the lowest leverage, and that's why operating expenses and investment is right at the bottom of an income statement. It's because it's the lowest leverage. Right, you get rid of some people. Well, people is normally a, a small percentage of the total operating expenses. So there the leverage is very small. If you're getting rid of 5% of your people, it will be 5% of 45%. That's a small fraction. If you think about increasing sales, the only thing that you need to know to predict accurately is about how much is your variable cost as a percentage of the selling price. So if we do the same calculation and I say to you, if I could sell 1% more volume, right, by offering the clients better reliability or faster response or better packaging or whatever it is that they would like, let's do the calculation together. So we already know 1% is $100,000, but I also know that my variable cost is 50%. So if I could do it with my existing resources, it means operating expense, sorry, operating expenses, Operating expense and investment will not go up, so only variable cost will change. If 
If I know it's 50%, it's about $50,000. The other $50,000 will drop completely to the bottom line. Which means I've gone from 550 or 500,000 to 550,000. That's a 10% increase in profit for every 1% more that I could sell. Those are where owners and salespeople should be focusing on, not how to save another dollar or penny. So that's what, what the throughput accounting does. It has very simple definitions, as I mentioned. Throughput, which is the sales revenue, less total variable cost. And by total variable cost, we really mean total variable, not allocated over it. Typically, only the materials and maybe distribution if you pay a dollar per ton, and sales commission if, there's, if that's variable. The rest are all operating expenses. So, throughput is the rate at which the system is generating money through sales. Operating expenses is the rate at which you are spending money to generate that sales. So, the ratio between those two gives me my real productivity. If I'm growing sales throughput, but I'm growing it slower than what I'm growing expenses, my real productivity will be coming down. We'll show you a, a, an example of that a little bit later. Good. So, how do we apply this to management? The title of my presentation might have given it away already, but let's see. We started asking ourselves about five, six years ago, where is the real constraint for business, regardless of its size? Because you can think about the largest companies in the world, like a Walmart, and you say, what percentage of the total world market do they have? Say 5%, right? They have a lot in America, but world market, say 5%. So can you really say it's the size of the market that's constraining their growth? No, you can't. It's rubbish. Right? Can you say it's supply? Well, they buy a lot of stuff to sell, but, you know, they buy a small percentage of what's available. So it can't be supply. Could it be capacity or space to put more shops down? Again, no. Plenty of land remaining. Yes, it's a scarce, finite resource, but we're not close to fully exploiting it yet. So that can't be. Could it be capacity to No, if they have a good business case, they'll get cash. So I drew this picture, and when you ask where's the bottleneck, the one answer comes out very obviously. It's always always at the top of the bottle. <laughs> so what does that mean? Anybody wants to uh, have the courage to say, what, what does this mean? Management. It's top management, right? So if you top management, guess what? <laughs> you are the bottleneck. If you have a one-man business, you are the bottleneck. It kind of relates in two ways. It says that the top management is the bottleneck, but it also says for us, the top is the bottleneck. It's our own assumptions. That's the only thing that limits us from improving our performance. Some of our assumptions are quite useful, like I can do something, right? And other assumptions are not that useful. They could even be hurtful, like I can't. That's why Henry Ford's famous quote is so beautiful. He said, whether you believe you can or can't, you're right. So, let's see what does it mean that the bottleneck is at the top of the bottle. So, let's apply the five focusing steps. We identify the constraint, and there's a few candidates that we looked at. We looked at uh, information, right? Could it be that we don't have enough information, that if we just get more information, then our business will flourish, right? And we said, well, how much do we need information? What's the part for us to make better decisions? And what's the supply? How much available data and information is there out there? Is there really a shortage or a bit of a surplus? And our conclusion was, you know, we actually need relatively little bit of data to run our businesses. And there's a lot out there. So information or the lack of information can't be it. And then we looked at attention. And we said, let's do a simple check. The number of things that demand your attention every day all the number of things that can benefit from your attention, will it always exceed your attention, your available attention? 
And our answer was yes. Not just sometimes, but always. The amount of things, the number of things that can either benefit from your attention or demand your attention will always exceed your available attention. Do you agree? Yes. Right? This is kind of an obvious conclusion, but quite profound. Because it now allows us to focus, to say, okay, so if this is really the key, if it's our limited attention, then how do we waste our limited attention? That becomes key for step number two, deciding how to better exploit and not waste our limited attention. Also interesting, other thing that we've considered is, could it be time? Could time be our constraint? Why don't we pick attention and not time? And our first check was with ourselves. If I got 20% more time every day, would I become much more productive? Versus if I get 20% more attention per day, would I become more productive? And attention is simply the process or the capability to concentrate undistracted on one thing or romantically on one person. At the exclusion of other things or other people. That's what attention is. And we all have experienced it. In psychology, they call it flow. When you get into the flow, is when you sit down late at night, you know you have a presentation tomorrow, there's no more time left, and you somehow magically finish this presentation in two hours that you could not do in the two weeks before. Why did you do that? Because you were able to completely focus your attention without any distraction. That's where the moral net is. The moral net is in our cognitive ability to, attend, to, to focus our attention. So if we can, we become hyper-productive. As salespeople, as owners, as operations managers, we all know it. If you can focus your attention, undistracted on the right things, you get a lot more done. So, what makes it so difficult is step two. How do we waste it? We said, okay, we know that if there's a gap in a, in a scarce resource between the demand and the supply, there's only two ways to fix the problem. We have to close the gap, right? We can do it in two ways. We can reduce the demand, which we all try to do, right? We all have priority lists, to-do lists. Any of you have got a to-do list? Prioritized? Okay. Why does prioritization not help? Or let me rather put it, why is it necessary but not sufficient? Too many priorities. Too many priorities. You see the problem is, if the demand always exceeds the supply side, all that happens when I prioritize some things over others, the other things move to the back of the queue. Until they become so urgent, they demand our attention again. So prioritization by itself is not enough. We actually need to stop and freeze stuff. And that's what this first strategy is. Is to actually look at the, the stuff that's taking up your attention and simply take stuff out. Not just try to prioritize it. On the other side, we have to find a way of increasing the supply. So what wastes our attention? We do things we shouldn't be doing. It's called errors of commission. smoking is bad for them. This is an example of doing things you know you shouldn't be doing. So how do we solve the problem? Oh, we tell people how bad it is for them. Right? We tell them about the positive of the change. Right? How good your life will be. And we tell them about the negative of not change. The real thing that's blocking them is not that they don't know. It's like the joke of the guy in the restaurant walking up to the, to the woman and saying, excuse me ma'am, your smoking is bothering me. And she looks at me very disgusted and she says, bothering you, it's killing me. <laughs> right? People know, <laughs> but they still get stuck. We keep on doing it. So we need to figure out why do we keep doing things that we know we should be doing? Why do we keep wasting a few 
hours of our scarcest resource every week to fill an expense gap that could have been done by someone much cheaper than us. Or sitting in meetings, or generating manually Excel spreadsheets to create reports that nobody looks at. How is this helping us sell more? You can question your ask. We also don't do things we should. Now this is an interesting thing, right? How can a non-action waste your attention? It doesn't take too much to think about how it does. When we don't do things we know we should, how do we cope with it? Well, we have to live with ourselves. So we keep on telling other people why we're not yet doing what we know we should be doing. You know that book I'm, I told you I'm going to be writing that's next year, definitely, you know, just definitely next year. I just don't have the time now. I know I should be focusing on strategic thinking. I know I should be focusing on decisive competitive edges. So we keep up telling other people and ourselves why we don't let that waste our attention. Just let it do the stuff, it will be much faster. And lastly, we repeat mistakes we don't learn from experience. So, a quick question to you. There are three errors we make, we all make, that waste our attention. Errors of commission, we do things we know we should. Errors of omission, we don't do the things we know we should not be doing. And lastly, repeating mistakes, errors of detection and correction. So, kind of as homework, if you allow me to give you some homework, might be useful from time to time to fill this in and see about how much of your available attention you're wasting on these three columns. And then, of course, remember the joke of the guy walking into the doctor and the doctor says, what's wrong with you? And he says, it, it really hurts when I do this. What should I do? And the doctor says, stop it. So when you know you're doing stuff that you to stop it. And if you're finding it difficult to stop it, go check. What's the assumptions that's blocking you? It's probably because you think that there's a positive of not changing and a negative of changing that you're scared of will have to give up or okay. go. So we're going to do a quick exercise. I want to focus your attention, bottom and bottom, on why do we say pay attention and not give attention? I think it's because we intuitively understand that there's a cost and a benefit to focusing our attention on something or someone. The cost is we give up, it's like an opportunity cost, we give up the benefit of giving that attention to other things or other people. And then there's a benefit, we gain the benefit of focusing it on that one thing or that one person. So practically, how do we deal with it? What's our common strategy or tactic of dealing with this dilemma? We have many things, many people that demand or could benefit from our attention on the one side. On the others, we have very little attention. Essentially, we multitask. So what I want you to do, it's going to take us about, uh, about 10 minutes to do. You guys need a break, so it's going to be interactive. I think in your folders, you've got some A4 sheets. So I'm going to ask all of you to participate in a small game. We're going to do a scientific experiment to see is multitasking the best way to get the most out of our scarcest resource, which is our limited attention. Even if you've played it before, play it together, it'll be a lot of fun. So, Goldberg suggested a very simple approach. If you go back to the, to the goal, in the forward of the goal, he actually describes beautifully the scientific method. There are many versions of it, some very complicated, some very simple. I by far like his, because he says the scientific method boils down to only two steps. He says, finally and most importantly, I wanted to show in this book, The Goal, that we can all be outstanding scientists. The secret of being a good scientist lies not in our brain power, we have enough. We simply need to look at reality and look logically, think logically and precisely about what we see. Step one, have the courage to face inconsistencies. What's an inconsistency? It's simply a gap between an expectation and reality. Ex inconsistency in business. I'm growing sales. Not all my costs are variable. So over time, what should I see? If I'm growing sales, costs should not grow as fast as sales, so profits should go up, profitability percentage. If it doesn't, there's a problem somewhere. Maybe it's got to do with how we budget. 
The sales guys say this year will grow by 5% and everybody else increases their budgets by 5%. That's a guaranteed way of making sure that costs are growing as fast as sales, right? So the second step is have the wisdom to challenge basic assumptions. And there can only be two assumptions which are wrong when I look at an expectation gap. Either the assumption on which the expectation was based is wrong. And sometimes we have kind of psychological biases that think we are special, right? If you think about from a personal life, what is the average divorce rate? Do you know? Average divorce rate. It's about 50% for first marriages. Do you know what it is for second marriages? 60%. And for third marriages, 70%, right? So if your marriage doesn't work out and you are terribly distressed about this and you look at it from a scientific perspective and you say, well, my expectation was that we will be together forever. It turns out that we not. How do I know that? Because she left me, right? Maybe my expectation was wrong. It could be. If I looked at the data, I would have said, you know, it's a kind of a toss of the coin. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. 50-50. Right? So maybe my assumption itself is wrong about the expectation. In the same way that scientists would look at the assumption on which their theory was based, on which they made a prediction, maybe that whole prediction was wrong. The second one is it could be that the assumptions that we had on which we took actions to close that expectation was wrong. And that's one that you're going to be checking out. So let's apply it to multitask, to management productivity. We're all responsible for doing stuff. We can call them projects, right? There's been massive advances in technology, software to run projects, and the know-how. So you'd expect that today, after all these advances, that all projects are done on time, in budget, with a full scope. Yes, that's your experience, right? Well, where I come from, it's so unusual that it makes public headlines when a especially public sector project is on time, right? Everybody expects it to be over time. The question from a recent perspective is, what's causing it? Is it the fact that projects are getting more complex, more uncertain, more resource constraints, or are we simply not using the right tool to manage projects? So we're going to test it. We're going to get three projects to do, each of the projects will be for a different customer, which means that they expect you to give their project the highest priority. I know it's right, quite a realistic assumption. Secondly, that they expect you to be reliable when you give them an estimate of how long will it take. Right? And we want to see what's the best way of doing these projects. So, you all have your sheets in front of you. So here's what the the round one is going to be, we're going to be testing doing the free projects with multitasking. The free projects are simply down, writing down characters. Project X will be writing down 1 to 20. Project Y will be writing the alphabet down A to T. And if you can't remember the alphabet, it's okay to see it, right? Just do it quietly in your head. You know, a, B, C, D, E, F, G, sometimes we get lost a little bit. And Project Z is just repeating three symbols. But we have to multitask. So we have to write the 1, then the A, then the triangle, then the 2, the B, the circle, 3, C, square. And we're repeating those three symbols, the, the triangle, circle, and square, until we get to the end. When you do a time study on yourself, what you'll find is it takes you about 5 seconds to write 10 characters, any character. So to do 20 characters should take you about 10 seconds. So if you had three projects like that, it should take you about 30 seconds to complete all three of these projects. But we have to be reliable. So we're going to give ourselves some safety, we'll double that time. So rather than commit to completing these in 30 seconds, we'll give ourselves 60 seconds to complete it. And what you want to see is how close you can get to the 60 seconds. So as I mentioned, please, everybody participate. We've learned something from education, is that when the lecturer is asking a question and one person puts up his hand, or she puts up his, her hand, and they answer, and the answer is wrong, and the lecturer gives the right answer, how many people will always remember the right answer? Turns out, in 
most cases it's only the one person that committed to an answer. The rest of us sit there and go, yeah, I could have gotten that right, you know, if you had asked me, kind of thing. So please participate. It will really ensure that you actually learn from this experience. Okay? So everybody right? Ready to go? The, the, the rule's very simple. Please don't cheat. We're doing an experiment. We're not trying to see who's the fastest. We're simply doing an experiment. You've got to be right in the 1, the A, the triangle, go back to 2, complete. If you finish, put up your hand and immediately check your quality and see how many quality mistakes you made. And please, like I said, it's an experiment, so be honest. Everybody ready to start? I'll give some encouragement from time to time in terms of the time. So, ready, steady, go.
30 seconds. Very good. 35 seconds. 38. 39. 40. 41. 42. 50 seconds. Great. Almost everybody finished. If you could do a quick check, please, we're doing an experiment. Have a look at if you've made any quality mistakes in round one. And then have a look at if you've made any quality mistakes in round two. Anybody that picked up any mistakes they made in round one when they were busy multitasking? Put up your hands quickly. Okay, very good. It's about 5%, maybe a little bit more. Anybody made any mistakes, please be honest in, in round two. Okay, it's much fewer. At least half of that, right? Good. So what we want to do is to understand a little bit about what happened. And the best way to look at it is to show the projects like this. So we had these two projects with 20 tasks, each taking one second, or the equivalent of, say, one day. Of course, we could have done them in 20 seconds or 20 days if we didn't have a resource constraint. But we had a resource constraint, so we had to decide how we are going to do them. And we decided to multitask. And this is the way that we planned to do the projects. Now, just from this, can you already notice something in terms of Project X? Project X is waiting two-thirds of its time for a resource to become available. Do you see that? As a result, the time it will take us to do it is three times as long as what we expected. We thought we could do it in 20. From a planning perspective, we're going to take 60. What will happen if you've added a fourth project in here from a planning perspective? Can you see that all four projects will now take substantially longer? All four projects you'll probably estimate about 80 seconds to complete them or the equivalent of 80 days. When we plan the project without multitasking, what we can now do is we can split the work time and safety because we said it should take us about 10 seconds to actually do the writing. We're giving ourselves another 10 seconds as a kind of a buffer. And then we see what happened in execution. When we did this, we ended up paying a price. And the price is called switching costs. Is when we switch from one task to another, we have to figure out where we were. It turns out that's not the only price that we pay. In psychology, they now realize that this idea of flow, when you're undistracted, the simple fact that you know that there's two other projects to do, will cause your work time to take longer because the mind is continuously distracted. It's not just when we switch, it's actually all the time. So it's taking much longer than what we would have expected. Whereas if we execute according to no multitasking, we do, if we need a bit more time, we use some of our buffer, but we don't make the common mistake that's made in, in uh, traditional project management software where because I've given this guy a start date, I've now finished before the start date. Do you think I will let it know? No. There's no incentive normally for me to let the other person know that I've, I've had an early completion. Because next time if I give an estimate, there will be cut, right? So I'm not, well, I'm not telling this guy when to start. I'm just saying I'll let you know as soon as this guy is getting close to ready, you can start already. And as a result, it takes us about 45 seconds on average to do this. Why do we multitask is an interesting question. Because this research, Goldberg at least, has been publishing this at least for 20 years. Right? So why do we continue to multitask? Psychology has known about this problem for a long time. But actually, the latest insight is that we can't multitask. We fool ourselves when we multitask. Because we have only one CPU that can do cognitive tasks. On our website is a little game that you can play, you drive to try to go through some toll road gates. By itself, very simple to do, you get 100% marks. Then you have to do some text messages. A question comes in, you have to text it back within a certain time, easy to do, 100%. You combine the two, you fail miserably at both of them. Simply because it's occupying the same cognitive capability. And we fool ourselves, we actually just task switching. So, the reason
reason why we multitask is because of a very common sense assumption. We assume that the earlier I start the project, the earlier I will finish it. Absolutely true when I'm doing one thing. Completely untrue when I'm doing two or more things. Then, the later I start, the second and the third, the earlier I'll finish. And a last thing to highlight from this is a rule that, that Ellie beat into our head was be careful. It's much more important to prioritize than how you prioritize. Please don't make a PhD out of the mechanism to prioritize. Because if you think about this, even if I got the priorities wrong and I put Z first, when in fact it should have been the lowest priority project, I'll still get everything done much earlier than what I would have had I not prioritized. So when it comes to your own productivity, make sure you prioritize. If you can't, then ask somebody else or throw a dart at the dartboard. It's still better than not prioritizing and trying to multitask. Good. So, there's a few other reasons why we multitask um, that we've discovered assumptions that block us. If we think it's impolite to say no or not now, we'll keep on multitasking. If we think it's unfair to give one thing higher priority than another, we'll keep multitasking. So, part of the exercise is for you to figure out if you are multitasking, and it's a very good chance that you are, probably much more than what you realize, understand why, because if you can't answer why, you're going to struggle to stop it. The brain will keep coming up with very good excuses for you to continue. Like, I'm better at it than anybody else. Turns out that the research is showing that uh, only 2% of the population can actually do two things at the same time. Only 2%. And men and women, the same. Women are no better at multitasking than men. The interesting thing from the research is that the 98% of the people that multitask think that they're really good at it. <laughs> and the 2% that are actually good at it, if they ask, do you ever multitask? They say, no, it's chaotic. I never multitask. So, really interesting thing from the research. Good. So, let's just summarize what we've learned from this small experiment. And this is why we do experiments. We started off with a challenge. The difficulty to improve our own productivity or the productivity of doing projects. We assumed that the main cause of poor performance is the level of complexity that we face, the level of uncertainty that we face in the work that we do, and all the resource constraints. What we've proven is that, yes, that could contribute, but by far the biggest problem is not that. It's that we multitask at all levels. And as long as we multitask, it increases the time to do things, and it increases the waiting time to do things. We cause causing projects to wait for resources. It also has some other consequences, in that it makes it very difficult to be reliable. It's almost impossible, like with the dice game that I showed you, to rely and predict when a project will complete. If you are accurate at predicting, the only plausible explanation for that is that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. There is no way to accurately predict the due date of a project when you are multitasking. Cannot happen. If you are accurate, you've cheated. That's the simplest thing. You've said 10 10 months when you know you can easily complete it in two months. That's the only way that you can be reliable. It's by far exaggerated. Also, if you think about multitasking, if you compare to yourself, how did you feel during round one? Did you feel in control when you were multitasking? If I stopped you and I said, how long before you finish? Do you think that you would be able to give me any kind of reliable answer? No. So multitasking causes a huge amount of stress on all of us. And we multitask, especially if we're at the top, it causes the people below us to multitask even more. Because we can't decide what should be changed, what should be improved, and what not, because we tell them everything is important, every little bit helps, more is better, we cause massive amount of multitasking throughout the organization. So there's one thing I hope that you take away from this, is it's one of those things, if it hurts, just stop it.
If you struggle to stop it, find out why. Why is it so difficult for me to stop? Is it because I find it impolite to say no or not now? Deal with it. Find some mechanism to deal with it. Else, you're going to be stuck. You cannot, you cannot improve substantially your performance. We know that there's a couple of reasons why we multitask. If there's too much work in process, or if we start working on things when we don't have a full kit. If we are trying to manage too detailed schedules, have local safeties and local priorities and measurements, we multitask. And the TOC solution for these things is called critical change project management. It simply says, pipeline the stuff like what we did. Don't multitask. Plan them in a way that you do one thing at a time. Control the work. Plan them, separate the buffer, and aggregate the buffer, and lastly, follow the priority and don't multitask. It's as simple as that, and the results that you get is, is staggering. It's almost always the case that you cut at least 25% from the project lead times, you get 25 to 50% more projects done. You improve the quality, and you take a lot of stress out. We've just completed a, a, a phase a release for SAP, probably the largest implementation of SAP in the world. Um, the total project is 5 billion US dollars. Uh, we've just done release 4 that had an original budget of over 700 million. By applying these simple rules, by pipelining and planning properly, uh, in planning we saved about 100 million, in execution we saved another 70 million dollars. So even the most complex projects, we've got over 1,300 uh, consultants, SAP consultants from Accenture on the project. The change in their behavior is very simple. Follow the priority. Only start when you've got a full kit. Don't multitask. Report your process, progress and issues, and that made all the difference. So let's look at how this applies to operational productivity. And there's a wonderful article that Golden wrote about standing on the shoulders of, of giants. And he compared what the big insight was from Henry Ford when he developed mass production lines. What the big insight was from Ono, and then what Goldberg did. And he said they all realized that number one objective for managing operations is to improve the flow. Practically speaking, it means reducing the flow time. Like what we did in a multitasking game is make sure that the project is never waiting for resources. This is a very counterintuitive thing because what we try to do is we try to utilize our resources 100%. But the consequence of that is that work are always waiting for resources. The way to really improve operations is to do it the opposite way, to have enough protective capacity that the work is not waiting for the resources. And, of course, what TOC does is it says there's a way of creating protective capacity, a counterintuitive way, slow, thing, slow the bottleneck down, and that gives you protective capacity in the other areas. So, objective number one is improve the flow. To reduce the flow time, you need practical mechanisms to stop overproduction and make sure everybody's following the right priority. Ford did this very simply. He said, if I want the first guy in that chain to not overproduce, Limit the space in front of him. If I only want him to do 20, make the space only big enough for them to do 20. Later on, he replaced the spaces with conveyor belts, but the, the mechanism was still the same. The space is full, stop. The space is getting empty or is empty. Work as fast as you can to fill it up again and then stop. Goldberg called it the roadrunner ethic, right? That roadrunner guy, beep, beep. You know, he's got only two modes of operation. He's either running flat up or he's stopping. He never liked jogs to slow down to the rate right of the bottleneck. That's what we want guys to do. That's what Henry Ford did. Ono came along and said, fantastic idea, but what if you do more than one car and you have more than one product that a machine must produce? And he realized that this mechanism can't work. You have to tell people what you need in the space. And that's where Kanbanks came from. Because Kanbanks are simply allocations of the space to say well, you need to produce two parts. What should be the priority? Well, the can banks can each hold, say, two parts each. The one that's empty, make that one first, because the chain downstream need that one more. When do you stop? When both can banks are full. When do you run in fast mode? When they are empty. Goldberg came along and said, what if you have so many products that to put can banks in between the machines 
will cause exactly the opposite of what you're trying to do, which is now you're just filling up containers, not knowing if there's actually going to be a demand for it in the future. And he said the only other practical mechanism to ensure people are not overproducing is time. Use time as a way of choking the release. So put two weeks and don't put more than two weeks of inventory in the system, regardless of which products they are. Number three principle is abolish all forms of local efficiencies and to put in place a focusing mechanism. So what I want to do is I'll, I'll summarize to say how can you know whether your system is balanced, whether the flows are balanced, whether your demand and supply is, is balanced. We know the problem when you're trying to balance capacities, right? Is that our supply is much less than the demand. So how do I balance and then show you how to apply it in two quick case studies. So the first thing to look for is that when a resource don't have enough capacity, queues will start building up in front of it. And if this access is the utilization of, the, of that resource, what happens very interestingly is that the queues are very small, up to about 80% utilization, and then it starts increasing exponentially. Very scary when you are predicting that the queue will keep on growing linearly. A small manufacturing company that I recently worked with, they supply castings to Toyota. For five years, they had 100% due date performance on four weekly times. One of their sales directors, new guy, went overseas and he thought, you know, we've got some spare capacity, let me get us some additional business. So he secured some additional business. It was only about 10% of the total volume, so he thought, it should be okay. The problem was it pushed the bottleneck machines literally just from here to here. Almost overnight, their real lead time that it was taking them to satisfy its orders went from 4 weeks in 100% reliability to 12 weeks with about 30% reliability. So you have to be really careful that you are not overloading resources. That's what we mean by protective capacity. That 20% is protective capacity. Of course, as you're doing that, your reliability starts dropping down. So it's a kind of a key turning point. How do I turn this into a good measurement system? I was this morning explaining to um, Alex and Akalia that I had an interesting challenge that was given to me by the CEO of, of Cisco. He said he didn't understand why if there was a, a disruption on the supply side, one of the factories that supplied me had a breakdown. Why does it take so long to recover lead times? And I tried to explain it, I wasn't very good, so I said, I apologize, let me think about a graphical way. And I came up with this very simple cumulative flow diagram. So imagine this is orders coming from your customers in, in dollars or units or tons that you simply map in cumulatively over time. So the time access and the dollars or units access. And then when that first order is actually shipped, you map it again, also cumulatively. Very quickly I can see if my system is balanced. What I can also do is I can read off what my average supply lead time is and I can read off what my working process is from this one simple graph. It follows Little's law, I'm not going to go into details for that, but it accurately predicts what happens if, for example, you had a very nice period at the end of the month, your sales velocity went up a little bit and then it recovered again. Look at what happened with your lead times and working process. Unless you have the capacity to catch up, it will permanently increase your lead time and permanently increase working process. And the same thing happens when there's a disruption in the supply side. You've got a strike on the railway or with the transportation guys or there was a major factory shutdown. Unless they have the capacity to catch up, your lead times will permanently increase. So as advice to you, the simplest way of measuring your business or any part of the business is to check if they are reliably meeting the demand within the expected lead time and to just map cumulatively stuff coming in and stuff going out. So if I'm a buyer, purchase requisitions come in, that's my inbox, that's a transaction that, that triggers that there's a demand on me, purchase requisitions go out. I want to check if those two things are balanced. If they're not balanced, I can see what's causing it. Is it a demand problem or supply problem? So, a good measurement system must satisfy three criteria.
everything. It must accurately tell me if I'm okay or not. This means that it must tell me when I should react or make a change and when not. So immediately it means if there's variation, I should have control limits. It says as long as my sales or profitability is in this region, don't act on it because you'll make it worse. But if it goes outside of those limits, now take action. The mistakes that you can make with this is that you report that you're okay when you're not. Or, mistake number two, you report you're not okay when in fact you are. If you think about an income statement, what frequently happens is if we produce more inventory than what we can sell, my inventory levels go up. Cost accounting says that we should get a benefit for that, right? We should get a cost recovery. So what they do is they give you a credit on your cost of goods sold. So in that period, it looks like sales has stayed the same, right? But because you've produced more inventory, your inventory has gone up, your cost of goods sold per unit comes down, so it shows that you've made more money. And you're very happy. What would have happened if you had sold all the inventory that was building up? Exactly the opposite. You have to give that profit back. So if a manager was simply looking at the income statement, they might, they might be getting the wrong signals and actually either overreact or underreact. So have a look at the measurements that you've got for your part of the business, the whole part, and make sure you don't make one of these two mistakes. The second criteria is that it must tell us what's the cause of the status. The mistakes here is reporting something as a major cause when it's not, and second mistake, not reporting something as a major cause when it is. And then the last one, it should drive the right behavior. Make sure that the parts are doing what's best for the system as a whole. And especially in sales, this is a big problem. So, some good measurements that I, I've got, thanks, is for your area or for the whole company, think about measuring cumulative flow. It gives you a very quick way of judging the status of the system. Are we okay or not? Are we meeting the demand that's placed on, on our unit? And it's also giving us a great indication about the cause of the status. For example, if an inventory buffer has gone down into the red, I know that's bad, but I don't know why. I don't know if it's because I'm selling faster than what we forecasted or whether the factory is taking longer to make it. Here I can read it off. I can see if it's a problem with the demand side or with the supply side. And then as I mentioned, you can measure productivity by taking your footprint over the operating expenses and mapping that over time to see if your productivity is really growing. The rate at which you're making money is it really growing faster than the rate at which you're spending money and try to understand why that's the case. The throughput is going down or up. What percentage of throughput is quality throughput or not? So let me end up with the two cases. The first one is applying these concepts to sales. And the second one is applying it to an IT department. So, in a sales department, improving <coughs> flow is number one. What does that mean? It means that I'm looking at what's flowing through my department that I don't want to be stuck somewhere. And this is essentially the sales opportunities that are going through my department. Does that make sense? For my sales, that's my food, is qualified sales opportunities that turn into actual sales, right? So anything that is causing a delay in those sales opportunities going through the system, because frequently I get an inquiry we have to do some kind of quotation, maybe even a design. I give the quotation back. I wait for feedback. That's the whole process. So I map the process and say, I don't want any delays in this process. What happens if there's a delay? It causes my sales cycles to go longer. It causes my success rate to fall down. And my margins to start going down because I feel pressure to start discounting to secure the sale. So at least all the work I've done doesn't go into a complete waste. The mechanism to prevent overproduction work here, it causes multitasking to take place, right? Because we have to give attention to all the sales opportunities in my pipeline. When I'm multitasking, I'm causing my engineers to multitask because I'm asking them to give me quotations or design changes. I'm causing my factory guys to multitask. So the more opportunities I've got, the more I multitask. Also, the sales cycles go longer, my heat rate goes down, and that turns into a vicious cycle because as my heat rate goes down, I feel pressure to go and get more sales opportunities. 
So I put even more sales opportunities into a pipeline that's already too much, causing even more multitasking. Abolishing local optima is looking at any policy or measurement that's in conflict with a decision to make sure that sales opportunities, the right ones go in, only the very good qualified ones go into my pipeline and that they're not delayed for whatever reason. A measurement like the number of opportunities in a pipeline is a really bad measurement because it's driving a behavior that more is better. So I measured at the end of the month how many opportunities am I working on and you can imagine what that does. People try to work on as many opportunities as they can but it puts them into a vicious cycle. And lastly, I need a focusing mechanism. I need some way to check what's causing most of my sales opportunities to be delayed or stuck, and how do I use Pareto to identify those causes that are most impactful. This was done, if you want a reference, chapter 21, uh, Rami Goldratt, uh, Ellis Sun, and, and Mauricio Herman. Um, they were the first ones that tested this in a company, a uh, company that makes a relatively medium, small to medium sized company that's in packaging. And they simply applied these principles. They said, let's see what will happen if we get the sales guys not to multitask. Make sure that they're only working on qualified leads. That they take the thing through the whole process and not be tempted to start others because there's some kind of delay. Really sticking to the principle of not multitasking. Frequent went up from 52% to 68%. So just a reminder, frequent here is not the output, but it's essentially the margin that I'm getting. It's my gross margin, right? Sales price, less total variable cost. Because there's less pressure to put discounts, your margin dramatically goes up. The average cycle time or sales cycle went down by 47%, and each ratio success rate went dramatically up. 263% increase in the success rate of closing deals because the sales guys and anybody else that's involved in the team to convert an opportunity into an actual sale are giving full attention to those well-qualified opportunities. So it shouldn't be a surprise, but it's still staggering results. So if you're interested, you can read chapter 21 from the Theory of Constraints Handbook where they describe exactly what they've done there and what they are planning to do next. Really stellar results. The second case study is applying this to IT department. So for an IT department, what's flowing through them is essentially IT projects, right? So it's very similar to the example we did that when we were doing the multitasking game. What's going through the IT department is IT projects. How do you make sure that you're focusing on the right thing? Is make sure that only well-qualified projects are going through. This technology project, in what way will it help the company increase sales, reduce cost or investment? If it doesn't, if it's not clear how, it really shouldn't be in our pipeline. Right? So from a flow perspective, if you say flow is number one, I want to reduce the time it takes me to get projects done, make sure I'm only working on the right projects. And as I mentioned, prioritization is not enough. I actually have to freeze some of them and stop maybe. The mechanism to prevent multitasking is choking the release. Don't start these projects as soon as possible, but choke the release based on some kind of limiting factor. The easiest is just to limit the work. To say we're not going to work on, say, more than two projects at the same time. And then abolish local optima. Again, you could have measurements like the number of projects in the pipeline and the ROI that they represent is how I measured or I measured on reporting, percentage complete. All of those things are causing behavior that causes delays in the project, that are causing projects to wait for resources rather than the opposite. And the focusing mechanism is again to see where's backlogs building up, where are tasks waiting for resources, that's your bottlenecks, and applying Pareto to them. This is a project that we did uh, in Japan, also an SAP project. The original uh, planned time was 24 months to complete the full implementation. It's about a $25 billion company. The 24 months were seen so aggressive that none of the implementation partners wanted to commit to that number. We used critical change project management to 
planned this project. We got the plan out to 18 months and ended up delivering on time with about a 10% budget saving and additional scope that was added. Uh, the graphs that you'll see here is a very interesting graph. It's simply saying, are we consuming the buffer that we've aggregated from all the local buffers faster or slower than what we're making real progress on the longest chain of this project, which we call the critical chain? If we're consuming the buffer faster than what we're making real progress, you can see what the graph does. Right? It's a big problem. You're in the red, and we know that already in week two. We don't have to wait all the way until the end. This is what a good project looks like. Is we're consuming the buffer, but at about the rate at which we're making progress. And as a result, we can accurately predict that we'll be on time. This was the advantages that we got in terms of reductions. Just over 25% reduction, reduction in lead time, and in cost, and as a result, in throughput. So, I'll end off by saying, one of the ways that we've learned how to stop you from multitasking is to figure out the level of difficulty, the tasks that you should give yourself and other people should be to keep you in the flow zone. So this is coming from uh, amazing work that has been done in the, theory, uh, in the field of psychology uh, by Cheng Shikumicha. He said that if this is the challenge of the task, if it's too challenging for your skill, you become anxious and you'll start multitasking, you'll start doing easier stuff to release the anxiety. At the same time, if, this, if the task is don't have enough challenge for your skill, you'll become bored and you'll start looking for other things. So make sure that the tasks that you specify is at the level that you realize that unless you pay full attention, you're going to mess it up. That's the way to trick the mind in terms of not multitasking. So, as a summary, our attention is the constraint. The bottleneck is at the top. We waste it by doing the wrong things, not doing the right things, not doing the right things right, like multitask. Even if we do the right things, we do them in the wrong way, and we repeat mistakes. So, priority for you, identify those things that you should stop doing, and simply stop. That will give you the protective capacity that you need, right? It will take away load. It will give you the attention that you need to really accelerate the few right things. Make sure that you pipeline these right things, that you prioritize, and don't multitask. And lastly, learn from experience. Anytime when there's been massive delays, when there's an expectation gap, stop and try to learn from experience. So, thank you very much. For your attention, I know it's your scarcest resource. <laughs>